It's another beautiful Sunday afternoon. This is Robin Minds. Welcome. My name is Abu Ka Obiuch, and thanks a lot for joining us as always. Um, just a few days ago, I believe, um, it was World Press Freedom Day, and um, uh, the conversation with regards to freedom of press in Nigeria is not a one that a lot of people understand, uh, not very exhaustive, and um, we are going to be opening up with that to understand, um, hopefully give us some better context as to, you know, what freedom of press actually means in, in Nigeria, where it stands. For a lot of uh, people, we see these rankings, and Nigeria doesn't seem to be at the top or even anywhere near the middle uh, with regards to freedom of press. And um, uh, I think I have someone here who's going to help us, uh, who's very well-versed in that, uh, Kasim Akinremi, who's, who's a journalist, first of all, and a former <laughs> NUJ president of the Lagos chapter. Uh, thanks for being here today. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, um, like I said, uh, freedom of press... <laughs> Not a very funny or pleasant conversation to, to have here in Nigeria for a lot of people. Do you agree with that? Yeah, obviously, because um, the freedom of the press means that um, there may be unfettered access to information and, of course, to uh, disseminating information. But the unfettered access we're talking about also has some limitations. Because where your right ends, that where the right over that begins. But the reality is that the role of the media is specifically set in the Constitution. So it's a right even given by the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999. Section 22 says the media is supposed to do what? Make government accountable. And another section of the Constitution also have freedom. Also have freedom association. Hmm? Freedom to also express yourself. So, but within all this, yes, the provisions is there. But the reality of the job <laughs> for the media is that there are three triangle challenges for the media. Reporting politics, reporting crisis, ethno-religious crises of the Arabs, and of course, reporting corruption. These are three landmines. Why are they landmines? Because I, I want to understand landmines. something here because yes. there's, there's arguments from, from yes. a lot of sides. People yeah. say we are suffering from a hangover of the military yes. era where there was just general fear. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a democracy. So understandably, yeah. the, the press couldn't have been as free as they could have been. Uh, we're 20-something years post-democracy now. Is that still the case? There's also a lot of flack that journalists mm -hmm. get, you mm -hmm. know, where stories are paid for, mm -hmm. allegedly. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a brown envelope, uh, mm -hmm. for want of a better word, culture, which seems to be an open secret mm. about how, you know, journalism here works. Mm. What is the biggest reason for this landmines existing where it seems like there's no, there's, there isn't enough mm. of fairness with the reportage here? The, the, the basic um, problem is understanding the role of the media itself for uh, the society and the practitioner themselves. Because at, at one point, you were young to ask yourself, am I in the right profession? Yeah. Or really in the right profession, you know what it takes. So you, you are going to be very careful and stick to the ethics of that profession. So there's nothing like brand envelope as far as journalism is concerned. Because there is no room for gratification. But it happens. Well, I'm, I'm not disputing that far, but I'm just saying that there's no room for it. So if you understand what the ethics says, there's no point for you to see, oh, you're going to expect sometimes gratification at the end of a problem interview or probably running the program. But you can also, because media is also, is also business. So you could, have, of course, pay for news. And that's why you have, I just said, you have adverts and all this stuff. It's, 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 it's allowed. But to the extent that is now, um, it, 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 it's impacting on grieving information freely on dissecting information freely, that's the challenge. Yeah. Because I have a right, you know, for, for example, for channels to give me uh, news, update me with news, information, and then educate me on what is going on, and of course entertain me. That's, that's the right that I have as a citizen. And of course, yes, the media house is going to give it out to me. But to what extent are what I'm getting has in that unfettered access? To what extent am I getting it freely? without some encumbrances. And that's why I told you about those landmines. Because yeah. they are real. 
You are reporting policy, for example. I mean, either parties will accuse you of being partisan. partisan. Right? Okay, you are reporting corruption because you, are, you want to dig deep into why certain things are not really working. Why some people have refused to you know, do what they're supposed to do. And then they are getting gratification somewhere. And so the more you are digging deep on that, they are not, they, of course, you are not their friends. And so if also in, interrogating government policies to the extent that what is the value addition for the people? And so if there is no value addition for the people, is it right for you to do this policy? Is this policy good? You know, if you are interrogating it deeply, there's also a problem because the people don't understand it. And if it is crisis, oh, that is the height of it. Because if you are in the middle of that crisis, you are in trouble. And if you also, you know, if you also sit back, we said, oh, well, it doesn't care about what is going on. They are not giving us reporting what they should report in terms of what crisis is all about. So that's why I said it's a, it's a landmine. For, for a journalist who thoroughly know, you know, actually knows his onions and is abreast of the professional calling, obviously knows what to do. That is why I said the ethics is already there. That's why the code of conduct of this job is there. So yeah. once you guide those jealously, of course, you are good to go. You, sound, you, you are painting a picture of almost sort of, there's, where do we go from here? Oh. It looks like you know, there's landmines and yeah. there's no way to yeah. walk around yeah. it. Yeah. We all know what the situation of the country is right now. Insecurity sure. is a big deal. Yes. And like you've mentioned, crisis yes. would always be uh, front cover news, Absolutely. For, unfortunately, mm -hmm. in this part. So reporting it is also very important. Yeah. There's in this era of fake mm -hmm. news where mm -hmm. we're not always sure what is right mm -hmm. and what is wrong. Are you, is this a Nigerian issue with journalists? Mm -hmm being caught in the middle when mm -hmm. reporting politics, like you said, or crisis? Mm -hmm. Or is it, a, is it a global issue? It's, it's, because it seems like mm -hmm. we, we see these things all over the world, and sometimes you kind mm -hmm. of understand what's happening. Uh, Here, yeah, you almost have to dig as an individual, not even as a journalist, to find the news. Yeah. I mean, it, it's all over. It's global. The challenges I'm talking about is global. But the extent to which each society handles this, or people understand this, differs. Oh, it could, okay, if it's about democracy, yes, it's... it's, it's there is right to fear hearing. And as a journalist, you want to balance your story. So there is a part of the code of conduct is fairness, right? Get the facts right. And of course, you have done all this. You have been fair to both parties and you have your facts right. But the reality is, seems that, look, people understand that oh, well, what is facts to you could not be facts to me. But facts I mean, should what, be facts. The, the facts, but it is facts. Right? But, and that is why you see, if you look at a popular axiom where facts are sacred, comments are free. That is, that is the, I mean, we had us to use it to that crucible of what we, understanding what our role should be. We're, we're being joined now uh, online by, by uh, Moses Omogena, who's also a journalist. Uh, Moses, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know, I'm sure you've been listening to the conversation here, but I want to get your opinion on, you know, our 20-something years of democracy so far. We even got a Freedom of Information bill at some point in the last couple of years, how would you rate the run of journalism? Are we doing better than we were in 99? Or have things gotten worse for journalists with regards to freedom of speech? Freedom of press, I beg your pardon. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Buka. Um, I, I, I really do think that we've, um, we've, we've gone progressive. Um, you know, by extension, I think we've done well, what we much better because of the array of tools that we have been open to. Uh, social media for, for one, you know, right? Uh, we've gone past where, you know, the access to news, the access to authenticity, the access to information was only made available to expected few. But right now, every Tom, Dick and Harry, you know, every man on the street, you know, has a stake in, in giving out what he or she considered to be news, right? Everybody has a voice. Everybody has a platform now. So that in itself makes it difficult for for you know, stakeholders and governments in this sense to clamp down on the voice of people. And I think that, that is a very progressive uh, thing. Listening to, I'm not sure what his name is, um, your guest in the studio. I came in quite a bit. Mr. Kazim, I can't remember. Um, Mr. Who? Mr. Kazim. Yeah, um, I, 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 I really do think that um, as a journalist, there has, to, there has to be a difference between what is factual and what is true. Because uh, something can, in fact, be factual, but not necessarily be true, right? And, mm. you know, in fact that, you know, um, the devil behind or whoever, the stakeholder in... Mm. Mm. 
you know, behind might in fact be tailoring you know the metrics. Not, but, but the truth is that he or she has an agenda, right? To cloud you from what really he or she wants you not to know or what to do. So there has to be a business to work with that with that mindset. Um, when we talk about being objective, being authentic, being fair, um, yes, it's great. Uh, but the truth is, every media organization, every media house, every journalist has a sense of loyalty, right? Um, everybody has a self-interest. To me, the true test of loyalty, the true test of, 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 of objectivity for journalists is when you're able to stand for the truth, even when the bricks are hitting your own foot. Take, for example, tomorrow, if Ebuka were to be rocked by a scandal, is Robin Mice going to carry it? That's the question. Is Robin Mice going to be, of, going to be objective in dishing out the story? That's, that's the, true, the true test of objectivity. So, yeah, that's really what I'm going to say in this regard. Okay, um, you, you kind of broke off a few times, but I think I, I got a bit of, uh, of, your, of what you were trying to say there. But uh, you talked about, you know, um, sort of being loyal to, <laughs> to whatever size they were. And I, I want to talk about NSARS, the protests that rocked the nation in October. Um, the media, interestingly, seemed to be in a position of sort of government was not happy with the media. The people were also not very happy with the media. The media was on its own, basically. People were saying, you guys are not reporting what's happening. People sort of turned to being their own reporters. Government, on the other hand, was fining <laughs> stations here and there and you know, sort of trying to um, control what was coming out. How do you think journalists and the media did you know, in a time like that? And how do you handle a situation like that? To be fair enough for sort of both sides to see what is, like you say, the truth. I think when it comes to the NSAS uh, movement and the NSAS uh, uh, reportage, I think we also need to understand, um, you know, what form of media was being used. I think social media, you know, should really be given credence here, you know, because social media during the NSAS movement seemed to have, you know, seemed to have the loudest noise. And that's what the world heard, right? The traditional forms of media, you know, TV, was not so keen on reporting, you know, it got to a point where it was social media who now gave traditional forms of media the courage and the boldness to, you know, to, to, to take a stand. Of course, when international forms of media and journalists also came in on board, right? As, as, as popular as it, as it may seem, there were still some very, some, you know, some traditional forms of media that were still, you know, uh, on the side of the government that were still saying, oh, you know, the, the numbers of people killed were exaggerated and all that. You and I know those media houses, I'm not going to call it. You know, but yeah, um, yeah, but, but I, I, I think that when it comes to media in the NSAS uh, rhetoric, social media was really a job well done, as opposed to traditional forms of media. Yeah. I'll come back to you, Moses. Uh, let me come back to you, Dr. Kasim, now. And um, he's talked about social media there a few times. Yeah. And I want to get your opinion on, you're a traditional journalist. You've mm. done this job for a while. You've even run the NUJ uh, in Lagos. Do you find social media as a help? to journalism? Or do you find that, like I mentioned earlier, there's fake news has become a thing now mm -hmm. since the US president you know, made it a mantra mm -hmm. where you have to sort of clarify things and you're sort of fighting social media. Mm -hmm. Is it an aid to the media, you think, or not? Ebuka, freedom comes with responsibility. And that's why you see a, a line of departure between state broadcasters and private you know, media organizations. You need to understand it very, very well. And Social media, yes, they've come to, I mean, assist, being part of what we call adjunct of the press. Yeah. But the reality is those who are, I mean, active in social media, most of them are not trained journalists. And so they do not understand those responsibility of a journalist. That it is not in your best interest to cause chaos. It is not in our interest for these countries to go aflame, right? And so, when you're going to process the information, you must understand that you're, you're, that information you're going to process is for the good of the people. So if the information, information you are processing is not for public interest and public, public good, then that is, that, that is a dilemma. And that's why it seems that the answer was, the media will also burn our fingers. Three media houses were, were, were on flames at that time, were on fire at that time. And as the chairman of NUJ then, 
I know my, my responsibility. I have to go out to see how do I, you know, help my, 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 my members. Some of them were thrown out of charge of job for a while because those media houses couldn't pay their bills and they couldn't even run efficiently. And before you, you also need to understand the ownership structure of the media is key. And so when people discuss media, people, society doesn't seem to appreciate what, what, what is all the about. dynamics that, that come into play. What society is interested in give us the news unfettered. As they Either you process it or you don't process it. As but what is the end product of giving out your information? That's why I mentioned public good and public interest. Yeah. So of, of what public good will, will is it going to do if we decide not to show where you know, people are instigating people to violence? So, so you're so going to encourage other people to do that. And that's exactly the fallout of that answers. And that's where, where you can see where the panel is going through all this now. They are seeing through all the evidences. And we can all see glaringly where the fault lines are. That's why I said we you are going to have the problem. You mentioned violence there. And yeah. I, I want to talk about Because we're going to talk about yeah, freedom the of the press yes. without talking about safety. That's absolutely and, um, correct. I mean, even here at Channels, we've lost a colleague uh, yes, a few yes. months ago yeah. as a result of, you know, <laughs> things we, we shouldn't maybe talk about now. But is the Nigerian journalist safe? And who and why is that if you don't think they are? Because there's a belief. Yeah. Like I talked about rankings at the, show, at the start of the, uh, of the show. Nigeria ranks abysmally it's not when it comes to safety yeah, of journalists. Yeah. Why is that? Yeah. For journalists to be safe. You are, you, are, you are as good as your last bar line. And so your safety first. And do you keep, how do you ensure that you, are, you, are, you are safe? First of all, wherever you are going to cover an assignment, you have to think of your safety. Where is it good for me to take the shots? So I won't be part of that story at the end of the day. It's important. Okay, even before I go, am I also insured? Do I have a life insurance? So in the course of this, because every profession has its own risk, we need to understand that. And that is the essence of insurance. So that is why the NUJ has an insurance key. We also encourage media organizations to have insurance for their, their, their workers. That's very but is it working? That's, that's another, that's, that's another, another issue entirely. Yeah. Another conversation entirely. And so once you do that, you end up soon done tracking devices. That's also monitor where you are. I mean, this example happened to Khashoggi. Look, the saving grace was the Apple Watch. Yeah. So how many Nigerian journalists can afford to have Let that? Let me just Apple get Watch? a final word yeah, from yes. Moses. Uh, Moses, um, who do you think, um, <laughs> I don't want to say takes a bigger blame, but where, do, where, do we lay, where does the box stop you know, with regards to fairness? For, of dissemination, because governments will always be in the conversation with regards to policy and all of that. But are journalists also doing enough, you think? Um, I mean, I really think it's 50-50. I think, um, I think while, 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 you know, while the government has its role to play, I also think that, um, I think slightly the big chunk of responsibility comes from the journalists, because then um, it's hard to be, it's hard to be fair it's hard to be credible in today's world, right? And, and, and really, um, when Mr. Kazim was talking about, you know, welfare and all that, I thought that was a very interesting side because then how do you expect a journalist to be fair or to carry his, his or her job effectively when he's not even paid for his job as being a journalist in the first place, right? You and I know that there are media organizations where journalists are working without salary, months of salaries on pay. And of course, when a wealthy senator or a House of Rep member offers a brown envelope, he takes it at, 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 the, at the slightest opportunity. At the end of the day, he needs to survive. So I think, I think that in itself is also, you know, is also a very um, lever that needs to be tackled. That the welfare, a journalist goes out with high chips on their shoulders, knowing that regardless of how much is being thrown at me, you know, um, I will do my job, you know, with the utmost sense of ethics. Right, and it takes a lot of grace and discipline to do that, you know. So yeah, um, when you talk about you know who takes the bigger chunk, I, I really, I, I don't think, I don't think that's what we should. I, I really don't think anybody has has a chunk of you know blame here. I just think that everybody needs to play their roles effectively. Government needs to safeguard the fundamental human rights yeah. of every human being, regardless of whether you're a journalist or not, and uphold constitutional acts 
as freedom of information, for example, you know, stipulates. And of course, every journalist needs to also be properly trained from time to time to All remind right. them that you have a role to play. You are a fourth asset of the realm. And so you, are, you have a very you know, significant role to play in society and hold that you know, to right. a high esteem. So yeah, I, I really think that um, that's where we need to go. Well, thank you very much, Moses. Thank you very much, Dr. Kasim. I mean, this conversation, I think, needs <laughs> probably two hours to, to dig into because there's so many questions I have about investigative journalism and, you know, what does the future hold? But unfortunately, we're out of time. Now, thank you very much, sir, for being here today. Thank you. And hopefully we talk about happier things when next year here. Yeah. We'll take a quick break now. I'll be right back. Please don't go away. Say All right, welcome back. I'm being joined now by someone who's, uh, I want to call it an academic, turned momager, um, an African giant in her own right as well, and uh, a ruffler of feathers, if I may use that term. Yeah, a lot of us know her as Mama Burner, uh, but uh, welcome, Bosse Ogulu. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me, Ibuka. Do you like that Mama Burner term? Do you like it? Because um... I, I get a feeling you are your own person. And as much as you work mm -hmm. with him, you would also like to be known as your own person. So what do you feel about being called Mama Burner as a term? It depends on what the term is for. Yeah. I mean, um, I've, I've said it before, you can't hate being called your child's mother. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, well, I'm proud of him. Yeah. But um, when, when everything you do is limited to that, then it becomes a bit irritating. Yeah. But otherwise, I mean, it's fine. But, you know, if you're talking to me about something I should know about, talk to me because I'm me. Yeah. You know, so that's sometimes, you know, people take I, I, I get people that. take a place. <laughs> and, you yeah. Know, but speaking, speaking of you as a person, yeah. a lot of us, you sort of came into our consciousness, I want to say around 2015-ish, 2014, 2015, 2016, with Burner. Uh -huh. Before then, he had been in the industry for quite a bit. Uh, we, were you in the scene with him at the time? Because I know you were in the, in the, in the education sector uh. working. When did the transition happen for you? So I'm going to ask you a question. How did I come into your consciousness in 2015? Then I'll know how, I don't to, know. how, to, how yeah, to... I can't remember. I don't know if there was up. a particular thing that yeah. happened. But, you know, we just started hearing, you know, his mom runs his business. His mom manages him. And it was about four or five years, I think, after uh. we had heard of him uh. that that happened. Uh. Okay, so Bernard Boy started in um, October 2010 yes. in Port Harcourt. Um, and um, from, even from before he took the name, he asked me to manage him. Okay. So I've always managed him. It was just that um, it wasn't a full-time thing for me because, I mean, I was raising kids. You have to pay bills. He couldn't pay Very me. Very important. He couldn't pay me. <laughs> so I had to do my work. Um, but, I mean, I signed the first deal... Um, on his behalf. Um, so I've always been there. Yeah. I've handled most of his bookings, but I wasn't involved in the day-to-day. -day. Um, he was with the label. They had a road manager. Yes. You know, they seemed to be on top of things. So I was just managing him, protecting his interests in, in whatever shape that I could. So but when did you I go full-time? I was part of it. And what informed um, that move? I think... I went full-time, full-time in 2017. Okay. Um, yeah, 2017, because uh, what informed that it was your question. Um, it just became evident that um, the day-to-day the -day and the other things I wasn't handling were not going as they should have been. Yeah. So, um, and I had more time. I... I had fewer kids going to school <laughs> that I had to pay bills for. And um, his business could also evidently grow to pay me. So, I mean, it was a question of, listen, I mean, this guy is, is honestly the most talented person I've met in, in the last decade or more, you know. And um, I just thought, I can't help you with talent, yeah. but I can help you with anything else, you know. And... Um, Fortunately, I, that scene is not new to me. Um, I've been doing business for most of my life. Um, I've been touring uh, for language immersions for most of my life. So it, it, there was just a lot I could bring to the table. And yeah. I just thought, look, if you work hard at this and make it work, it will pay you. It will, you know, your son will grow to his 
highest potential. And, you know, it would be a win-win for everyone. Yeah. You've said pay twice now. Yeah. And I find that, uh, I mean, this is your son. Yes. And, um, but he's also a talent you manage. Yes. How distinct is that line? And do they conflict sometimes? Because, I mean, with a mother, emotions are involved. But with business, business is business. But you are both. Mm. So how do you draw the line between, okay, this is my son, but, oh, I'm working for a pay here. Yeah. Okay. So a manager doesn't really get paid paid. You get a commission of what the artist makes. So if the artist doesn't make money, you don't make money. Yeah. You're not on a salary. Um, also in life, I've seen that people do not respect people they don't pay. You're not, you know, yes, you don't, True. yes, you don't respect someone you don't pay. You don't value their, um, when I say respect, it's not in terms of family or whatever, but in terms of getting a job done, um, and you're, you're also not committed to something you're not being paid to do. No matter how much you love the person, you're going to look outside that box to make an income. So if you want me to do this 24 hours, that's going to come in. Um, I think I lost your, your question somewhere in there. Yeah, you, how, how do you draw the line between modern? How do you draw yeah. the line? Oh, yeah, the first thing was, does it, is there a line of conflict? 100%, 100%. I think that's also why um, I wasn't in the day-to-day until, until then, I think by 2015 that you're talking about, um, you're right, I started taking on, you know, uh, bigger roles and, you know, just widening the scope. Um, and the reason I didn't before then, because also there's maturity. Maturity had to come in both ways, not just from him, but from me as well, because I needed to understand that. Listen, the, the, the reason you're privy to this part of his life and this information about him or you are in control about in, uh, of, of this part of his life is because you manage him. Yeah. It's not because you are his mother. You know, so, um, and when your child gets to a certain age, you also respect them and you respect their space. And um, in, in, in that environment, like I said, it's, it's a great talent. So I needed to respect him more as well. That's one of the yeah. things I learned. And, you know, just take off the mother hat sometimes and, and put on the, the and say, listen, this, this is work. This is work. And, you know, sometimes till today I would say things like, okay, so now this is your mother talking. <laughs> and, you know, and then yeah. that's where we go to just because I said. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then, and then you know, back and forth happens. Exactly. And the back and forth happens. Is it happens. hard to manage? Yes and no. Yes and no. Um, he is a perfectionist about his craft. Um, so what's his craft? Making music yes. and performing. We had to get that clear. You know, that's your job. Um, interviews, he hates. <laughs> um, all the promo stuff, he hates. He just wants to do music. He just wants to do music. Um, the touring, he loves the performing on stage. Getting there, he hates. Getting there on time, he hates. So, <laughs> so and you have to handle all. Yes, of that. and you have to handle, and you have to handle all that. I mean, so it, it's those are the parts of it that are not easy. But anyone that's worked with him will tell you when you get him into a studio, um, he's not going to leave until he's finished the songs he set out to do. Even if you're going to stay till the next night, you know that's yeah. so. That has spoiled me a bit because. When I'm dealing with other talent, I find that it's not everybody that goes at that pace. So um, for, for, for what is his craft, he's easy to manage. But for the other aspects of, you know, you must do promo. You must do PR. Um, you need to smile even if you're not happy. You, you know, you, you need to be nice even yeah. if you can't stand this person. Um, you know, so all of that. And tell me again why I need to do this, you know. <laughs> yeah. So that's, and, and he knows what he doesn't want. He gets in the news quite a bit. Mm. Uh, not sometimes, not for not very pleasant things. Mm. You know, he's quite controversial sometimes mm. on social media. Mm. He even tweets sometimes, let me be fast before my manager comes and seizes my phone. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. How do you handle those? Because he has those moments. Yeah. And for some of us, it's, oh, okay, we understand everybody's vulnerable. Uh -huh. But it gets him in trouble, quote unquote, uh. sometimes. How do you handle those moments where he just wants to be himself? Forgetting maybe uh, you're burner boy, you know, mm. you are this person. Mm -hmm. do, does it worry you when he goes off like that or when those moments come up? Well, worry is a strong word. Yeah. I'm not, 
I'm honestly not very big on social media opinions. I, I really don't care, honestly. Um, I'm more interested in what is real and what's happening, you know, before me. Yeah. But having said that, because he's a brand, you, yes, your hackles do get up <laughs> when, because you're not going to change him. He's not going to, if he, if he does a tweet and I do a tweet, you're going to know the difference, you know. Um, and what I've come to learn is that artists are, at least artists like him, they're like tapestry. If you pull at one thread too hard, everything will unravel. So you must make allowances for this person being himself yeah. because it is that emotion. It's the same emotion that what you love about him comes from. It's, it's the same place. It comes from the same place. Yeah. So if you push too hard at one thing, you're probably going to lose the other. And, you know, you won't be helping anyone. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, within reason, we, <laughs> we do what we <laughs> can. I've been yeah. known to grab his phone when he was on Instagram <laughs> Live. But um, uh, sometimes I'm like, listen, you talk, they talk. You don't talk, they talk. Yeah. So and We see where he gets it from. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the Grammy. Congratulations, because you also won. I mean, the, the team. You, you all worked hard for that. Congratulations mm. to Thank you, you and, and everybody who works. Sorry about that. Who works on that, the, the, the album mm -hmm. to win the Grammy? Did you see the, the, that one coming? Because a lot of Nigerians were like, yeah, this one is going to win this time. Mm. I mean, the first one, we were not so sure. The second time, mm. it was like, he has to win this. It was a great album. Did mm. you think he was going to win? Because we saw the video you guys celebrated. Mm. You kind of expected it, didn't you? Yes. And how did you feel? <laughs> did he expect it as well? Yes. Okay. Quite so honest. confident. Yes. Um, yes, because um, to be honest, we expected it last year as okay. well. Yes, we expected it last year as well. But um, and we were in LA and all of that, and then it went to Angelique and you know all of that. And I'm a great believer in things um, happening in in good time and season. I, I think you get blessings when you're ready for them. Um, God is not going to make you rich when He knows you can't handle it and He will kill you. You know so. You know, I, I, I just kind of took it that way. But I knew that there was no, there was nothing else they could be looking for. I mean, it just, I just knew. And so did he, you know. So maybe what I didn't know was the role I would play in it. Because I co-executive produced it. So I actually probably do get a Grammy. <laughs> yeah, so. so I said yes, thank you. Um, so that, that I didn't see coming. Um, a lot of the fallouts of the Grammy, I didn't, I, you know, didn't see coming, didn't think that far. You know, I just, my thing was, this guy has worked this hard. And, you know, I, I knew he was going to get a Grammy someday. I knew. I, I knew since he started music, to be honest. You know, so, um, but the whole, the, the honor that came with it, um, I knew it, was, it meant a lot for the country. But um, I didn't think people would react that as positively. As as yeah, especially, you know, the, the organized awards, uh, the reverse the date one and all of that. And, and people just turning out in such great numbers. I haven't seen it happen for, yeah. for anyone that's not a politician, yeah. except maybe <laughs> Fela, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. I mean, very well deserved. Mm. You talked there about, you know, expecting to win the Grammy. Mm. And a lot of people get that from Burner mm. when he tweets or does the occasional interview, mm. the confidence, which is what you're saying now, mm. sort of is confused with arrogance. Mm. Do you mind that he's seen as arrogant? Do you mind that you were seen as arrogant with the way you run the Burner brand? Um, I don't mind, honestly. So answer that quite clearly. I don't mind at all. I mean, I think any adjective they want to attach to you is okay. The, the thing is, who are you? You know, and, and, and I think arrogance, I'm not sure, I, I'm, because I'm a linguist, I'm a bit fussy about words. Yes. I, I'm, I, I would right now, I would love to look at the real meaning of arrogance because I know that there is one that means knowing your worth yes. and carrying yourself as such. If that is arrogance, then it's a good thing. I think pride is what is a problem. If, if I'm not mixing up the words, yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> but, but if, if, if knowing your self-worth and carrying yourself as such is not, I can't, I can't apologize for that. Because I think um, we, we, we were born into a world where we're expected to put our heads down, you know, 
first, the color of your skin, the color of your passport, uh, for me, my gender. So yeah, I, I, I don't understand that concept of life. Yeah. I, I understand that, you know, if I know something, I know it. And I expect you to realize that I know it. And if you don't realize that I know it, then put me to the test. You know, but, and you prove yourself. And you prove yourself. But if you don't know it, make yourself teachable. And don't be an empty barrel. <laughs> so no apologies. No. Great no. stuff. Uh, you, you mentioned the reception there. And I want to talk politics now. Because in Nigeria, politics is very, you know, mm. it's very murky waters, mm. if I may use those words. Mm. And, you know, the River State reception happened. Before that, we had seen the activist burner. Mm. You are also very big on activism with mm. the NSAS protest and all of that. He spoke up very well. Mm. The reception happened, there was a perception mm. by a lot of people that, oh, now he's whining and dining with the same leaders. He abused people for not standing up against. You know, how, what were the optics for you with that? You know, with the River State governor, I mean, money was paid, whatever the case is, but did you feel some type of way, or did you get what people were saying? Mm. Because he had made a video saying, Nigerians, you people um, just, you don't speak up enough, basically, for want of mm. a better term. And then we now see him with the same people uh, hanging out. Did you, did you feel some type of way about it? Or did you see the point people were making? I mean, so the first thing is money wasn't paid, okay. by the way. It was paid Just to everyone care. else but him. Okay. Everyone else who came to perform was paid by him because they were honoring him. He wasn't being paid to be there. You know, he's only, he's only a, for want of a better term, he's only a bastard, my people say, that refuses honor in, in his, his father's house. house. True. You know, so... Um, so for me, the, the optics, I, I don't really understand. I didn't pay much attention to it, to be honest. I was too busy, which is what the case is, honestly. But it, it, the, the facts are very clear. This man was honored because he got the highest award in his field in the world. He was honored because he brought that award home. Why did he get that award? making the same music that speaks the truth. So I don't think anybody was trying to buy him to their sides or not. Yeah. I think it is very clear to everyone that the man will always make the music he wants to make. Whether it is for fun or for uh, didactics, you know, whatever, he would continue to do that. No one ever asked him for that. It wasn't a deal. It wasn't a case of um, let's honor you, but you will not abuse us again. <laughs> you know, that didn't come into the conversation. Yeah. Um, I, I think in the case of River State, and it, it was very wise that it was done. I was particularly impressed because if any other state had done it before River State, it would have been shocking, you know. And um, so any other person that wants to honor him should invite us and we'll be happy to go. Great stuff. Let's talk about you now before we mm. go. What's I, I was beginning to feel it was the Bonner Boy interview. <laughs> um, is is Bosse Ogulu happy um, with the trajectory your life has taken? Um, what's next, you know, for you as a brand, uh, besides Burner Boy or with Burner Boy? What's gonna be happening with this evolution we've seen from the academics? to, you know, this uh, running a business of music and another. We'll take a quick break. Uh -huh. So we'll just ruminate on that. And when we come back, we'll round up this conversation. Please don't go away. All right, welcome back. Now we're going to conclude our conversation with Bosse Ogulu, uh, Mama Burner. And before the break, I'd ask what was next for you um, with the brand. Well, first you said, am I happy? Yes. I'm ecstatic. I'm very happy as personally and career-wise. I'm happy, you know, because um, for me, I came into this, ma this managing him and all of that as, you know, as a form of sacrifice. Yeah. It wasn't ambition. Um, and it's, it's just gratifying to know that it's become work that I love and can actually come up with something to leave as a legacy. Um, the next thing was, what next for me? Um, keep doing what I'm doing. Um, hopefully, grow more talent. Right now, I'm big on producers. Um, you know, the other artists we have are there. They're doing their own thing. And, um, you know, we just want to grow it. And my, my real focus is on catalogs 
belonging to, to us. The to us, great. To us. It, it cannot belong to the artist yeah. for now because you have to pay for it. Um, but I think if it's with us, us being spaceship, you stand a better chance of getting it or getting some cut of it back eventually somebody, yes. than with somebody in America <laughs> who is just going to flash dollars in your face and, and keep it for much longer. So I look forward to when, when we can have that, you know, standing solid yeah. um, and just breed more artists. Thank you very much. Expanding the, the empire, the, we, more Grammy winners, hopefully, <laughs> and just more success exactly. all around. Thank you very much exactly. for all you do. And, exactly. Um, Looking forward to Bonner's album. We know he's working on something. Yes. Looking forward to that uh, dropping whenever it does. Um, we're going to switch our conversation now, and um, we do have a guest joining us. Still talking about young people, actually. I know the British Council uh, has a next generation program which they're working on, and I think Ojoma Ochai is online. Ojoma, if you can hear me, how are you doing? Hi, how are you doing? I very can well, hear thank you. you. Okay, very well, thanks. Um, what's this report about, the next generation report, and what is it trying to achieve? So Next Generation is a report series that the British Council has done all over the world since 2009. And what Next, Next Generation seeks to do is really to examine the conditions that support young people to live more creative, more fulfilled, more active lives as citizens in the countries in which they are. And so we conduct the research in countries that the UK considers strategically important. Um, and in, in the research, we seek to, to understand a number of things. So in, in the countries where we're doing it, we want to understand what matters to young people in that country in terms of their values, in terms of their aspirations. We want to understand how much of a voice do young people in that country have and to what extent do they feel like they can shape what happens in their countries and communities. Next Generation also seeks to understand what vision young people have for their communities and their country. And finally, it looks to understand what policies young people think that the country or community needs to develop to ensure that young people have, um, have a voice and are able to use that voice to shape their own future. And so that's really what Next Generation was seeking to do in, in a Nigerian context. And that's what it is. So it's First and foremost, that um, research process that allows us amplify all of those things I've talked about in the context of what young people want. Yeah, so I get a sense from you now that this is not a Nigeria-specific um, research. Correct me if I'm wrong, if it's happened other places. But with Nigeria specifically, um, because we have a very young demographic here, the youth is way, I think some people say 70% sometimes of the population, which is a huge chunk of, you know, of our demographic. How does this report help? You know, we see so many statistics these days with unemployment, with just creativity generally. Uh, it, it's not very exciting for a lot of Nigerians. What does this research do, if anything at all, with, you know, with that space? So um, I think it does do a lot. This is the second time we're doing this research in Nigeria. The first time we, we did the Next Generation Research in Nigeria was in 2010. And if you've heard this phrase that we often talk about, youth not oil, is the future of Nigeria. That phrase came from the very first Next Generation report that we did. And so for us, it's about giving voice to things that maybe we already know, but labeling them and putting words to them and then giving them visibility as a result. And I think something else that Next Generation does is to, to articulate the complexity and the sort of multifaceted nature of the, the, the conditions that young people are living in. So in a Nigerian context, 10 years after the first next generation, what we really wanted to understand was the country has gone through a period of rapid change, um, whether that's culturally, economically, politically, and it was the 60th um, independence anniversary last year. And so we were wanting to take that moment to reflect on, right, 60 years after independence, what are young people thinking and feeling and how can we give voice to that to support the platforming and amplification? And the idea is that by supporting that amplification and advocating for young people with the stakeholders that they sort of address through what they say, 
those aspirations, those, those thoughts and those feelings that young people have are taking into account in policymaking in, in the country. Yeah. So is this report, is it a public, is it something that we can access and how do we access it if, if it is? It is public. Um, people can see it on our website. Um, the website is www.britishcouncil.org.ng. And so people can go there and it's, it's on, on the front page, but it is publicly accessible. Yeah. What was the most interesting thing that jumped out at, at you while doing this research or reading the research or putting it together about the young Nigerian? Um, so there was a lot of validation of what we already knew, like young Nigerians in terms of their aspirations, their innovative, their independence, their positive and their hopeful. But I think something that really stood out for me was when we asked young Nigerians across the country what was most important to them, 98% said their families, which, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's surprising in the sense that I'd have thought that people would have talked about jobs, even though it ranked high, it was only third. So um, family was first, religion was second, and work and economic activities were, were third with about 85% saying those were the most important things. But also something we found really interesting as well was that leisure was also a top priority for young people um, in, in Nigeria. Another surprising thing for me was that only 39% of young people think that the top five priority of the country for the next five years should be prioritizing economic growth, which considering the, the trends in the last few years, I think yeah. we went in thinking it would be slightly higher than it ended up being. And then I suppose the final thing to say is in terms of the top value for young people, um, they identified security, and for them, security was the top thing that they wanted to achieve for themselves and for their families. So that was also an interesting piece of insight that came from the research. That's very interesting. I mean, family topping is, <laughs> I'm also slightly surprised. I mean, it's a good thing. It just wasn't what I expected, I think, based on what you're saying. But thank you very much. Just quickly before we go now, give us uh, the website again so we know where to go to. So the website is www.britishcouncil.org.ng and when people get on the site, they'll just see the report. Okay, and your mm -hmm. social media handles because that's usually easier now for this generation to At access you from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. On Twitter, you can find us on Twitter at NG British. So NG, N for Nigeria, NG British on, on okay. Twitter or Instagram. Okay, thank you very much, Ajama Chai. Looking forward to perusing this report and uh, thanks for all the good things you do. Thank you. Good to be here. <laughs> All right, that's our show. Thank you very much for joining us. Like I always say, so you can follow the conversation on Twitter at Robin Minds now is the handle. Please use the hashtag Robin Minds when you tweet at us. Do you have a good week? I'll see you next Sunday.